Ryan Stanton here with A Set Frontline, joined today by Tricia Shackelford Esquire. We thought, with all of the COVID uh, excitement going on, we should probably touch base with some of the legal aspects that we need to deal with from a healthcare physician and other staff standpoint. So, um, I've worked with her before, and we wanted to uh, bring some information now and, and see if we can. Uh, shed a little bit of light on what to expect as we move forward with regard to the legal aspect. And I think one of the big things we've heard bouncing around and um, thoughts being the uh, approach to Imtala and uh, that being the law of the land since uh, the mid-late 1980s with very little change in terms of the um, requirements for us in emergency medicine, especially with regard to the uh, medical screening exam, uh, establishment of a, an emergent medical condition, and then stabilizing measures so um, thanks for joining us Tricia and uh, and uh, how do we really approach the idea of Imtala when we have a worldwide pandemic that's been declared so yeah I think that's an it's, it's an interesting discussion um, and one that probably doesn't isn't forethought or in the forefront of people's minds when you're worried about all the other medical decision making that goes into triaging all these patients. But when it comes to Intel, what you've got to be thinking about is um, doing screening and then stabilizing. So you've got to screen and you've got to stabilize before you can discharge. So a lot of, I think there's going to be a lot of decision making going into triaging. Um, also, I think you've got, we've got to be thinking about what kind of, facilities do we have available on our campuses to treat these you know where, where are we sending people within our facility when they present and one of the big things that even our hospital has been discussing is once the numbers go up in terms of COVID cases and uh, separating basically separating those patients that are being evaluated for COVID um, versus those that are there for all the other emergency processes that we see on any given basis what are the options for hospitals and emergency departments when it comes to addressing a potential surge in uh, COVID cases and the idea of separating that from our other cases? Sure. So what what I'm reading and, and seeing is that that they're we're, they're kind of breaking um, that down into into different sections. So people, you know, facilities are setting up certain areas within their their ED departments or within their campus um, that they are segregating as potential COVID cases only. Facilities are retrofitting other spaces that are off campus or campus adjacent to shunt these either either the potential COVID cases or separating out the non-COVID cases. And then um, we're looking at community partners as well that are also taking on some of these screening functions. Um, you know, the, these community partners are not subject to the MTALA requirements, but they, you know, a lot of these community partners are stepping up and helping because of the sheer numbers. Well, that being said, though, the, the um, MTALA mandate still, advise, still states and is still in place that if somebody presents to the emergency department requesting care, then they must have the medical screening exam and then uh, stabilizing uh, care. And once you establish that there's not necessarily an emergent medical condition present, then they could, of course, be shunted to one of these off-site uh, or separate uh, type facilities not associated with the emergency department or not part of the emergency department. I assume that is still the case in the law of the land is that there's not nothing that's changed from the federal standpoint with regard to this, is there? No, there's not. It's important to note that I think the community is doing a lot to kind of educate the public on assessing their own symptoms and health situation and presenting to the appropriate place. And facilities certainly can try to get the message out that if you don't have symptoms that fit the COVID profile that going presenting to another health option um, other than an ER or an ED um, would be appropriate. Let's leave the emergency department for the cases that you know, required that level of care in those types of facilities. However, 
if somebody presents to an emergency department and might have better been served by one of these other facilities, an emergency department, hospital emergency department or their staff can't send that person away without the appropriate screening and potential stabilization if that's required. As we move into this ongoing management of the COVID pandemic, um, again, our hospitals had these discussions about the medical screening exam. And I think for most of us, we assume that has to be physician, nurse practitioner, PA. What are the rules about uh, as we try to limit the potential exposure to COVID in order to protect our frontline healthcare professionals? What are the rules going to say about who can provide that medical screening exam and how do hospitals outline who that is? So right now, the medical screening exams can be done by a physician, an advanced practice registered nurse, a PA, or a registered nurse with the appropriate training. I think what's going to be interesting as this pandemic unfolds is what kind of relaxation there are going to be on who would be appropriate to provide those screening exams. I've already seen, and I talked with general counsel at the Kentucky Board of Medical Licensure this week, uh, I think all states, I know Kentucky has relaxed the requirements on uh, licensure. So if a physician who is licensed in a state other than Kentucky would like to provide care in Kentucky during this health crisis, there is a mechanism to do so without going through the licensure process. It's going to be interesting and very probable that as um, cases, you know, as, as the cases continue to mushroom and we see um, it reaching critical mass and our healthcare workers and resources being strained, that we're going to be, one of the things that we're going to be doing is looking at um, other folks that will be qualified to provide those exams. There's also the consideration of the use, and I know there's been a lot of push for the whole idea of, um, of telemedicine. With regards to the MSE, does the MSE have to be performed face-to-face, or can that be performed virtually, such as, I mean, they're on the, the grounds, but say the patient's got a, you know, an iPad or device or something of that nature, does, does that have to be face-to-face or can that initial MSE be performed um, with some sort of barrier or remotely in order to protect um, the staff from potential exposure? That's the other thing that we're seeing is a relaxation on the telemedicine requirements. So yes, I think that we are going to move to these virtual types of screening exams in general to utilize telemedicine, you're required to have a video component. So you have to be able to actually see your patient. Those rules have already relaxed and telemedicine is now being utilized and approved via telephone only. I think we're going to get to, you know, if we continue on the course that we're seeing here in the U.S. and the way this has played out in other countries, I I think we're going to continue to see relaxation and heavier reliance on telemedicine and relaxation of what's actually required uh, to be able to perform screening exams and diagnoses via telemedicine. One of the big uh, thoughts and components of EMTALA has been the, the rules associated with transfers, accepting of transfers, but of course we don't have a benchmark for what is the capacity. I mean, none of us physicians have a certification or a even a um, some sort of approval um, credentialing within our hospitals to say that we are capable and, and qualified to take care of COVID-19 or pandemic patients. What is with regard to that transfer and that accepting of transfer? Because theoretically, it's a viral illness, uh, but it's a viral illness that requires uh, isolation, uh, ideally negative pressure uh, situations once they're admitted to the hospital. Um, with regard to the um, transfer of these types of patients, what are the rules NIMTALA going to tell us that we need to do or can't do? I think that that is going to be a moving target, and we're going to see that evolve. I think that as hospitals reach capacity, 
I have heard talk of retrofitting vacant spaces, Army Corps of Engineer coming in and, and retrofitting vacant spaces to be utilized. As you were talking, you need isolation chambers and zero pressure. Uh, there are specialized requirements to treat people with highly contagious viral diseases. Um, and, and that is, I think, still an unknown as to what that's going to look like as these transfers take places. And especially in a state like Kentucky, where a large percentage of our population live in rural communities that have community hospitals that just are very quickly going to be maxed out at their capacity or don't have the capacity, facilities or resources at all to deal with anybody that's going to test positive. Um, you're going to see, you know, our metropolitan areas are going to, I think, hit a saturation uh, point very quickly. Our hospital is actually already making the uh, plans in terms of extra spaces has turned a CT scanning suite dedicated for uh, COVID that rule out patients um, into a negative pressure environment, gotten extra bed spaces, turned an entire portion of the emergency department into a negative pressure wing. And it's pretty impressive if you give people motivation how fast things can happen. And, um, you know, now thinking about the potential of what extra spaces in case we need them. And hopefully with the social distancing and role and uh, rules that have been put in place by most states so far, we're going to see that number, um, those numbers flatten out enough to maintain the integrity of the healthcare system without uh, running out of uh, spaces. But that does bring up, you know, we're, we're hearing a lot, uh, whether true, whether more, uh, whether more chatter, social media type chatter than anything else with uh, places like Italy where they're saying we're having to ration or decide who gets gets that specific care. And that kind of falls in the face of, of Imtala that says your obligation is to provide that um, stabilizing care, um, that stabilizing treatment. What happens to Imtala considering potential worst-case scenarios, and I'm sure some places in the United States will, deal with the strain on the vents and things like that. What happens when we get to the point that we saturate the healthcare resources in that area with regard to Imtala and we can't actually provide that stabilizing treatment? I think that is a excellent question. And I think that is one that, that people with uh, better minds than mine are working on right now. It's my understanding that, that, that is, you know, in the healthcare um, policy sector, that is something that is being looked at. What are the rules going to be? What is the decision-making tree going to look like when we get to a point where we have, as you said, saturated our resources? And it's not a question of dump this patient off without screening them. It, it becomes a question of we don't have the people to do the screenings or we don't have the rooms or the beds or the vents to take on the care of these patients, even if we identify that they've been infected. Um, uh, you know, I think that our healthcare system was not ready for something of this magnitude. And, you know, the part of the social distancing and all the school closings and um, business closings is giving us the ability to um, have a little bit of breathing room to try to figure these things out. Um, hope, you know, the hope is it's not going to happen because we've moved quickly enough. I'm not sure that I, I think that that's going to be the outcome and it's more likely that it, that this is just going to provide a brief respite and pause for us to gear up, but I don't know that we have the answer to that question yet as to what happens to MTALA when we get to the point where we've reached critical mass and can no longer sustain the patient load with the infrastructure that we currently have. Interestingly, the um, uh, as we've been discussing all of this and wondering where it's going to go, you know, U.S. has pretty decent per capita access to critical care resources um, because much of the world doesn't actually approach critical care like we do uh, in terms of giving everything as much as you can to that very last breath, um, you know, and, and understanding that we're all on this 
one-way street, and eventually we're all going to have the uh, same outcome at some point, hopefully not associated with this. Uh, But the United States does have a lot of critical care resources, our pulmonologists, our critical care departments of various types. And so we've got decent uh, decent access at that point. But the issue with this, where we've been in similar situations in the past in terms of um, disasters, is that the disaster tends to be a very small part of the country where we can shift resources within the country. But dealing with a pandemic-type situation, the entire country is, is dealing with that, if not uh, the entire world at this point. And so you don't have that really opportunity to shift resources as much. Um, So we're kind of dealing with it. We're also seeing the issue with kind of the lean aspect of things uh, with regard to uh, healthcare resources where things on shelves are money lost um, or are costing as opposed to having significant reserves. And now we're seeing that, especially with our PPE um, resources that... Uh, We don't have much in in terms of reserve. And so we're seeing the CDC relax PPE requirements without really necessarily data. I I believe it's more pushed towards towards the access to PPE more than just any science specifically to the the virus itself. And, of course, then uh, when you get... Anytime you get a, a suggestion that you should use a bandana for PPE, if, if that's all you've got. Now, looking at some of the research, you know, the thick T-shirts and things like that may provide 50 to 60 percent of the uh, protection. But you're talking about significant exposures uh, to these types of things. Uh, what do you see in terms of from a legal standpoint? You know, the fact that we're asking physicians and nurses and techs and housekeeping and security and all these things to go into um, these healthcare situations without access to um, all the PPE that that would be recommended. I mean, we're seeing countries where people are still in these uh, full hazmat type outfits and ice, you know, as, as far as you can go, like the moon suits. And then, of course, in, in situations here in the United States where we're all uh, being told that, yeah, maybe a surgical mask is fine. Just wash your hands a lot. Good luck. Yeah. And that was something that I did look at when I was, you know, prepping for our, our conversation this afternoon. And right now, the guidance uh, coming out from CMS and the federal uh, rule makers is that lack of appropriate PPE is not an adequate reason not to treat. I don't know. I'm sure you're seeing the same things on social media that I'm seeing where people who have, uh, you know, a skill set and a talent for sewing have stopped doing whatever other work they were doing. And they are now cranking out surgical type masks as quickly as they can. Um, But it is but I I think that is a, a wonderful observation that in other countries that the barriers that are being in the protections that are being used to um, create barriers between healthy people and non-healthy people are not necessarily um, what's being mandated here in the U S and as far as Mtala goes um, lack of appropriate PPE is not a reason to deny treatment. Uh, I had a client the other day that, actually had to uh, fire one of their physicians because he refused to um, triage sick people. And, you know, that <laughs> that didn't work for my clients. So. Oh, and, and absolutely. I mean, I, I think Imtala is a clear requirement. And I think most of us in healthcare went into this job knowing that there was going to be risk involved. I don't know that we could predict a, a pandemic, but at the same time, we all know we're going to be threatened. We all know we're going to be exposed to infectious diseases and illnesses and all all types of things. So I think you naturally increase your risk by choosing medicine as a career. Uh, but uh, let's let's check it out from the other side in providing care. I think the vast, vast, vast majority of physicians, nurses, and other staff in the emergency departments and frontline, uh, let's look at medics and EMS as well. Um you know, what about what is the potential impact um, or legal obligation you know, to the hospitals or the employers if a physician or somebody is told, hey, just use a bandana or tie a sheet or, you know, tie a T-shirt around your face and they end up getting um, COVID? 
and have a complication. I mean, we already know there's three emergency physicians at least in the U.S. that have contracted it and are in critical condition. What is the recourse of the uh, physicians if they feel like, or others, if they feel like that um, access to proper PPE wasn't provided by, by their facilities? Yeah, that's and that's going to be an interesting question because, and again, I think that's going to that's an evolving. That the answer is not clear on that right now. That certainly in the scenario that I just mentioned, uh, that provider was entitled to say, "I am not willing to to treat that population of people," and then the employer is within their legal rights to say, well, we no longer have a job for you because the job requires this. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, so in those circumstances, I think a provider can say, without the protective equipment, I'm not willing to do the job. What's going to be interesting, and we see this in when you're not in a national or a worldwide crisis, but we see this a lot in uh, hospitals' requirements for on-call coverage. The hospital has a requirement to provide on-call coverage, but medical staff doesn't have that requirement. So you have the two entities aren't necessarily in the go, rowing in the same direction, if that makes sense. Um, and I think that the same applies here: is that the hospital or the facility has the obligation under EMTALA to provide these medical screenings and these stabilizing treatments where appropriate. Um, But you've got to have the providers that are willing to put themselves out there to provide that service. As far as what what, um, tools are available in our legal arsenal to protect the providers that might become sick because their employers didn't have the appropriate equipment I think the employers are going to argue that the providers were aware of the risks and and chose to proceed in light of the conditions and that they took on that that risk themselves. Um, OSHA, I think, is also going to play into this, and that's a little bit outside my uh, area of expertise, but I think that the OSHA experts are going to say to find that there are going to be requirements workplace safety requirements under the OSHA laws that are going to provide some protections to um, healthcare providers in these circumstances. One of the things that I've been seeing happening, and you know, we're, we, we've chatted uh, email, text uh, over the last couple of days, and so I'm a little bit off of kind of the, 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 the planned, but um, you know, our physicians and just kind of getting an idea of the, the conversations on some of our pages, physicians talking with each other, many physicians, and I'm sure many other healthcare uh, professionals as well, uh, are seeing the writing on the wall with regard to N95 masks and availability, asked to reuse them over and over when theoretically they're single use uh, designed. And so many of us, including myself, and mine arrives tomorrow, um, are, uh, which actually for everybody, that's the day that this podcast is released. We're recording on Sunday. I'm releasing tomorrow. And, um, and many of us have uh, heeded kind of the advice of uh, OSHA and CDC and, um, and 3M and NIOSH and others that have said, you know, some of these non-healthcare devices such as the respirators like uh, I'm looking at the LPR 100 you know provides equivalent or more protection than the traditional healthcare n95 mask and those are reasonable alternatives and many are buying them on their own if you can find them now um, luckily I was about a week ago I ordered some from me, my wife and I can since she's health since she's a physician as well and we're getting those my plan is to transition to that in terms of my respirator uh, when I'm in the healthcare setting, uh, what are your thoughts on one moving towards that? But then two, we're also seeing healthcare facilities saying to physicians, you can't wear that because it's scary to the patients because of course they've got kind of a, they've got kind of a Batman mask, uh, type look to them. Some of them just the, the half face, the smaller type versions. 
you know, but they're saying they're scary to patients, they're intimidating, those sorts of things. So you cannot wear your own mask. Now, what are your thoughts on one, going to your own type of device that provides equivalent or advanced coverage, or and then two, healthcare f- facilities saying you can't do that in our house? Yeah. So uh, there is nothing legally to prevent a provider from providing their own PPE. Um, it, you know, I, I'm not surprised that that's happening, and I think it's a, a good idea. And I, I think you know uh, we are in uncharted times, and and we are going. To, it's going to kind of kind of figure it out as we go. From a facility standpoint, I can certainly see as a hospital administrator being concerned about patient perception. And I think that there's just going to have to be a common sense balancing between between allaying patient fears and having our, our community be at ease and taking seriously the virulence of this and the communicability of, of COVID-19. I mean, it's, it's, we, it's like something we have never seen before. We have never seen a communicable disease move so quickly through communities and countries and states and have such a devastating effect on the total world population infrastructure. So I think that we're going to have to look at relaxing the requirements of having patients not get scared um, because what are we going to do if our frontline healthcare workers become unable to provide care because they have gotten sick and there's no one left? Exactly. And I, th- I think, you know, if you're an administrator listening to this podcast, you know, a high enough administrator that you've probably got carpet in your office and nice windows and, and don't hardly wear scrubs, um, then if you put patient satisfaction at this point in this pandemic, if you put patient satisfaction ahead of the safety and wellness of your frontline staff, physicians, NPs, PAs, nurses, techs, everybody, even you know, especially when they're going into work, knowing the risks associated, potentially isolating from their families uh, to protect them, um, I don't know. I don't see uh, you having uh, significant longevity in leadership, coupled with success in terms of your facility. You may have longevity. Uh, but you may not have. I don't think you're going to have success because what I'm the feeling I am hearing from nurses and physicians and others is that people are scared. It's the first time I've actually seen a lot of physicians scared, a lot of nurses scared. Um, a lot of times we'll walk into emergency departments just with this cavalier John Wayne type attitude. But I'm seeing people actually a little bit nervous now um, for the first time in my career in medicine, and for many that I've talked to that have been in medicine much longer than I. And so I think at this point, we have to set things aside, understanding that hopefully this is a blip in the history of our healthcare system. And as we must all work together, understanding that it's not going to be the perfect scenario. We're not going to be able to provide that perfect kind of um, Hilton or Marriott type experience when they come into the hospitals uh, with everything they need. I mean, it's already scary enough where most of these patients are in rooms, significant limitations on visitation. We're coming in with gowns and masks and shields and N95s and gloves and, you know, like everybody is the plague, but potentially everybody is infectious. And I think what we're learning from this virus is that you don't have to be overtly febrile, cough, shortness of breath, the picture of COVID-19 to actually have it or spread it. And many times it's much milder appearing. So, you know, if you're an administrator uh, listening to this, I want to make sure that you understand that this is about two things right now, and that's protecting your folks who are protecting your patients. Uh, Because uh, as uh, Tricia just mentioned, you know, what do we do if we lose uh, our frontline folks, those that know how to manage emergencies and unstable medical conditions? What are our next options? You know, there's, there's possibly people we can shift in that situation, but now we're putting them at risk. And those that aren't necessarily trained in this type of emergency, in this type of medicine, and um, what about delays in care? What about delays in other types of medical conditions, our strokes, our heart attacks, all those things as well? And so I think we've got to make sure as administration to hospitals that our, your primary goal at this point should be to take care of your 
physicians and staff and then give them the tools necessary to then serve your patients and do what they can do for your patients. Um, and because it's an interesting time right now for sure. And, um, and I think that's, uh, that's a big consideration. We have to take care of each other at this point. Uh, Tricia, we, we talked about, you know, a lot of things. We'd work kind of loosely through a lot of the discussion points and questions that, that you'd proposed, but one that we haven't talked about is if we have a patient come in, um, and I think the tone of the question that you'd put was a little bit different than the angle I'm going to take, but it can be both. Um, if somebody comes in and we highly suspect COVID or we, you know, or we find COVID, especially once we get here in a couple of weeks and we have access to tests that can be done in a timely, realistic fashion, what if somebody wants to leave AMA? What are our obligations in terms of public health and safety? If somebody with COVID-19 decides to leave AMA, and of course, then our uh, potential uh, patient that is significantly ill, and we and we can't stabilize their emergent medical condition before they want to leave. And, and again, I think that that is going to be one of these questions that we're going to work, or the answer to which we are going to work through on the fly. Um, because certainly it's a public health risk to have somebody with known that's you know known to be infected with COVID-19 free freely moving around uh in our community. So I, I think in that circumstance the facility and or providers that have that knowledge are obligated to make that known to the appropriate public health authorities. But I think there is, I don't know the answer right now as I sit here to the question, what, what do we do with that person? Right now, the you know, county legal authorities are going through the rosters at the Fayette County Detention Center. I'm sure that's happening all across the state and all across the country, you know, trying to figure out who can be released, which is another mm-hmm. discussion and in, in, is... For, for reasons beyond the scope of this discussion, absolutely terrifying to me anyway. But do we lock these people up? And if we lock if the answer is you lock them up, where do you lock them up? Is it, where's the balance between allowing these in, known infectious people access to, you know, freely move through our community? I, I don't, I don't know what it seems to me that there is not going to be a good answer to what we do. And that may be one of the uses for, you know, discussions about retrofitting vacant buildings. Um, Mm -hmm. Maybe there are vacant, you know, martial law. I mean, it's terrifying to think about having to implement martial law and take away our basic freedoms. But if people don't cooperate, uh, you know, I I don't know if that's where it's going to go, but that would be a potential solution or mechanism to address the problem would be some sort of declaration of limited martial law and restricting people's freedoms. We've got, and that is actually, that's, and that's exactly what I was rolling into, is that, that the, one of the best gifts of the United States in terms of our republic experiment is the... Is, is our freedoms. And then one of our biggest weaknesses when it comes to dealing with things like this is our freedoms. And, um, and don't, don't want necessarily, I'm not asking for specific thoughts, comments, or uh, opinions on the particular case. But here in Kentucky, we had the one person um, who was COVID positive, who refused home quarantine, and is now, I guess, still uh, under guard. Uh, at their home from the sheriff's department. And of course, once you get on social media and other sources, you're hearing people talk about, yes, absolutely super selfish person needs to be, you know, thrown in jail or whatever. And then you have the other side that says, what kind of country are we, where the government's taking over and telling people what they can and can't do. But from a public health standpoint, we can't have somebody that's just free willy nilly 
going purposely against just to prove their uh, prove their their freedom of decision um, and potentially exposing people who could die from this illness. Um, what are your thoughts on you know the fact that in the United States we have these uh, these freedoms that are imparted by being fortunate enough to be in this country, but also the limitations of those freedoms in terms of controlling an infectious illness such as COVID nineteen. Sure. Um, you know, I think that, that this is a different angle on uh, what we looked at and dealt with after 9-11. There, you know, I, and I think we're going to have the same um, phenomenon. I think there's going to be pre-COVID-19, what, what life was pre-COVID-19 and what life is like after COVID-19. And I don't think the two are going to be the same. Um, I think there was, you know, things that changed after 9-11 that will never go back. And and there were ways in which our ability to freely move around our country were permanently affected. It's a different motivator, but I think we're going to be see, having the same sort of discussions. Where do we balance individual freedoms versus community safety and community good. And that's going to be a evolving discussion uh, that there's really no good answer to at this point. Um, certainly selfishly, um, and I'm sitting here thinking about my two beautiful children. If I thought that there was a risk that either one of them would be subject to getting sick because someone was selfish enough not to take precautions to contain uh, being a contagious individual. I, I would want everything done possible to avoid that. But that's not what our country was built on. That's not one of the founding principles of our country. And I do think it's important to keep in mind that our freedom is one of the things that Americans hold most precious. Um, so that's gonna be a tough question. Where's the line? Where's the balance between protecting individual freedoms and, and protecting the unit versus the one? It's an interesting uh, topic in conversation with that because it, it runs into the idea of your personal freedoms versus the personal rights and freedoms of others. And, you know, people talk about I can say whatever I want whenever and wherever I want because it's my rights and freedoms you know, not considering that the other person or the other people around you have those same rights and freedoms, which their rights and freedoms may be protected to be to be protected from your decisions and and, and those exercising of those rights as well. So, I mean, I think that's always a, a an evolving discussion and um, uh, argument and debate within the American experiment. You know, uh, of personal freedoms and rights versus those of the uh, populace and those around you. And when it comes to COVID-19, I think we're understanding very quickly that the this social distancing, isolation, quarantine is important, but we're also making that transition now from a prevention standpoint to more of a management and containment standpoint of trying to limit the numbers to the point that we can manage it with our healthcare system, medical services, um, you know, basically spreading out the cases instead of having this huge spike. I know we've all seen that, um, that, um, the 1918 flu of St. Louis versus Philadelphia in terms of who did what and how and how the curve played out. And um, St. Louis had that huge spike that overwhelmed everything. But of course, they ended their cases earlier. And then Philadelphia had the lower uh, trend curve and it lasted longer, but never overwhelmed the healthcare system um, of kind of how do we work together as a society and, and, and groups to uh, manage these situations and help to prevent something from be, uh, becoming uh, a bigger issue. So talking here with uh, Tricia Shackelford, Esquire, a uh, local uh, lawyer that I've uh, chatted with and worked with in the, in the past here in Central Kentucky, but also uh, dealing with uh, national-based issues, talking EMTALA, uh, COVID-19, and really a, a shifting landscape um, with a lot of questions. And I think that's what we're dealing with as we move forward is there's a lot more questions than there are answers. Um, and as the public asks us for guidance and direction and things, and I think the answer a lot of time is 
we don't know yet. We, we just have to see how this really plays out and what we're going to do and really make, uh, make uh, changes and adjustments on the fly uh, as we move forward. Any take-home messages for the physicians, PAs, NPs, nurses out there from your standpoint, seeing this from the, from the legal aspect of a, uh, from a viral pandemic? I think my takeaway is do what you know is right. I think the debt of gratitude that the American people owe you and all your frontline healthcare professional colleagues, there, there's no way that we can adequately ever address or thank you all for the hard work that you're doing. And, and I think that in times like these, as long as you do the right thing, what you, what you feel is the right thing, if your motivations are pure, that then it's, it's all going to work out just fine. And one thing that I've tried to remind myself as I uh, move through this is to try not to react from a place of fear, uh, because I think that reacting fearfully never produces a good result. Uh, so, you know, trying to be calm and, you know, calculated in the most difficult of times goes a long way. Trisha Shackelford, uh, Esquire, how can folks get in touch with you if they have uh, questions, want a little clarity, uh, at least the best clarity that can be provided in a situation like this? How can folks get in touch with you? Sure. Uh, my phone number is 859-629-629. 3302. Uh, you can look at our website at williamskilpatrick.com. And my email, unfortunately, I have a long name, so my email is a mouthful. It is T S H A C K E L F O R D at W K T law.com. And remember, all emergency physicians and emergency medicine folks out there that uh, Trisha has um, a reasonable uh, life hours in terms of awake during the day and sleeping at night. So if you are that third shifter, um, two in the morning may not be the time to uh, contact Trisha. Uh, just to try to make it during decent hours. I know in healthcare, we're used to just not knowing what day it is or what time it is, but uh, the rest of the world doesn't necessarily revolve that way. So uh, be respectful if you're going to, especially if you're going to call or text, uh, be respectful of timing, of course. Um, as for me, you can contact me, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, at Everyday Med on Twitter. Um, please share the podcast um, on uh, SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio uh, with your friends, other healthcare folks, families. We've definitely, we've got that uh the uh, lay public version of the podcast we released uh, back um, after the first week of March that provides some information geared towards patients and the lay public. And we want to make sure everybody has decent and the most accurate, up-to-date information. And what I talk about today is definitely not going to be the uh, likely situation here in two weeks or a month or whatever it may be. So remember that things are going to constantly change, uh, but uh, we want to help you get the best and most up-to-date and I appreciate uh, Trisha being willing to answer some of these questions that I've seen flowing around on social media and Facebook, EMDocs, those sorts of things to uh, to um, address some of the concerns and some of the questions that physicians and other healthcare professionals have and uh, we'll continue to bring you these types of episodes kind of as the evolving COVID-19 takes place to make sure that um, we have as much information as we have to try to stay as up to date as also as as well as safe and healthy as possible. And uh, as for me, uh, thank you for tuning in. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline.